You are listening to Concussion 101, a patient's guide to getting ahead again. Episode 10, My Head Hurts, Part 2. Today, your host, Dr. Tahir Chug, sports MD and medical director at York Region Concussion Clinic, will continue his discussion about post-traumatic headaches and talk about the roles of stress in headaches as well as the role of complementary and integrative medicine. Enjoy. Welcome to the 10th episode of this podcast series, Concussion 101. My name is Dr. Maud Boulanger, and I'm a medical doctor at the York Region Concussion Clinic. And I'm here today with Dr. Tahir Chug to continue our discussion on post-traumatic headaches. In our last episode, we discussed some general information about post-traumatic headaches and some generally under-recognized factors that can weigh in on headache patients' experiences. In this episode, we'll be talking more about the role of stress in headaches and the role of complementary and integrative medicine in our post-traumatic headache patients. So, Dr. Cho, stress has been identified as a number one trigger for headaches. Most headache patients can identify with this. Our response to stress changes our physiology. It is often helpful to explain the physiology of stress so patients understand that it's a real thing and that it can be measured with using technology and that they're not helpless in the face of it. There is something they can do to manage it. Yes. You and Caitlin, our uh, occupational therapist, discuss a physiological stress response in detail in episode 5. Can you give us a quick recap of the physiological changes that stem from stress? Well, we also discussed in the last episode some of the neural networks that weigh in on the experience of pain, like cognitive and emotional networks. And so we can also relate to how stress affects and is affected by cognitive and emotional factors. Uh, But basically, stress in the body results after a real or imagined threat occurs. When you say imagined threat, um, you mean that threats to something that someone values that may not come true? Right. A lot of what we feel is threatening in hindsight turns out not to be so threatening, but it hijacks our present experience of that moment. And these threats then get registered by our limbic system. For our listeners, the limbic system is in the subcortical brain and is a major center for processing emotions, memory, and the fight or flight response. Right. The message of the perceived threat is sent between the amygdala and the hippocampus and then onto the hypothalamus. Again, for our listeners, the hypothalamus is a control center for the autonomic nervous system, a system we also discuss in episode 5. And it's also involved in survival functions like maintaining vital signs and concentrations of many vital messengers in our blood within a narrow, healthy window. So the hypothalamus then sends messages to our autonomic nervous system to trigger the fight or flight system we discussed in episode 5. It also sends messages of the perceived threat to the pituitary gland, the master gland that directs many other hormones in the body. The pituitary gland then sets into motion events that ultimately lead to the release of stress hormones. These stress hormones called corticoids can have many disadvantageous effects if maintained for longer periods of time. Effects on our immune system, body repair, digestion, and even brain function and structure. That's interesting. Chronic stress has been shown to change the structure and function of the brain. So what is the point of stress? From an evolutionary perspective, stress is useful, hence the term fight or flight. The idea that as cavemen running away from saber-toothed tigers, the fight-or-flight system will give us a boost to increase our chance of survival. But when this system gets hijacked by stresses that are not really that threatening in the same sense, when they happen chronically, then we run into problems. So how can cognitive processes help check the stress system from lingering on longer than we need? When those first messages are sent to the hypothalamus, the thalamus sends a message to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes is the part of the brain that's responsible for executive functioning. Yeah, things like planning, reasoning, logic, attention. It's sort of like the conductor of the conscious orchestra. Right, things that you're not really doing when you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger. So the fight-or-flight system will sort of take over for the frontal lobes. And it may take a few minutes for the frontal lobes to come and regain control over the orchestra, so to speak. However, 
If the frontal lobe thinks that the threat is real, then the fight or flight show continues until fighting or flight can get you out of the situation that triggered this reaction. This process takes energy. Many are surprised to hear that the brain consumes about 30% of the energy of your body. So it seems like a small part of your body compared to some of those massive muscles, but it takes up a lot of energy. Also, neurotransmitter levels can change with chronic stress. And also, if you get into the habit of doing this, then you're in effect practicing what fires together, wires together for something you don't really want to encourage. And then add to that the stress hormones we discussed a moment ago sounds like a real storm. We were discussing an interesting article published in the journal Headache in 2017 regarding the role of stress in triggering migraines. Yes, that article showed that the likelihood of a patient developing a headache can be predicted by the levels of stress in the days leading up to the headache. These researchers are working on making clinically applicable prediction tools to help foster awareness among patients and healthcare providers of the stress headache link with the goal that stress levels will be managed before they eventually turn into headaches. So you mentioned stress in the days leading up to a headache. Many patients think that stress is something that is on or off. And many of us think of headache triggers being like the classic MSG trigger for migraines that usually occurs something like 45 minutes after its, after its ingestion. Most medical conditions are a case of the straw that breaks the camel's back. The idea being that it's not the final straw placed on the heaping load of straw on the camel's back that's the problem. It's that heaping load of straw that's the problem. Exactly. The big stresses we tend to face every once in a while, like the loss of a loved one or weddings, even positive things can be stressful. Mm -hmm. um, a child moving away to college and so on. We tend to deal with those well. And fortunately for most of us, they're not too frequent. So it's not like the brain will get into the habit of that neural firing pattern in the context of those rare occurrences. Also, because of the nature of chronic mundane stress, it can be hard to correlate stress with the headache um, because stress that you have been having over the last week can be accruing and then lead to symptoms several days later. In fact, many migraine patients suffer from what's called the letdown phenomenon. Right, so that's the aftermath of that perfect storm we were just discussing. The idea being that those corticoids and other physiological adaptations to stress that keep you going in the face of running from that saber-toothed tiger should not be going on and on or you'll get tired. And once you hit the brakes, say, for example, when you can finally relax on a weekend after a big audit, you can experience a whole bunch of symptoms, including headaches. Yes, emotional and physical stress through several mechanisms have been shown to cause inflammatory responses in the body. A common theme in medicine is that the body tends to adapt to the new status quo. For example, if you move to a cold environment, it will take several weeks, but your body will adapt to that new temperature. So when your body gets used to stress, the new baseline level of your immune system and your neurotransmitter levels in your brain adapt to the stressful environment. So when you remove the stress, you'll be in a different place than ideal, and that can lead to a flare-up of even things like asthma or susceptibility to infection. Okay, so how does um, CBT uh, or biofeedback fit into this? So cognitive behavioral therapy and biofeedback can help check this process. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a huge topic, and I can't explain it properly in this short episode, but basically it deals with making patients, one, uh, more aware of things to which they don't react that well, uh, two, rehearse adaptive ways of thinking and behaving to these stressors, uh, three, develop action plans that will actually help matters. And four, learn coping skills and mindfulness. Obviously, this will also depend on many other things like healthy living, stress and energy management techniques, exercise, good diet, uh, efficient sleep habits, the right amount of socializing. Yeah, it's true that many of us these days say um, that we don't even have time for socializing, but we shouldn't feel guilty about making it a priority. We are social beings. I read some papers discussing the role of social media on our psyche nowadays and that social media may be having the opposite effect um, on us that intended. Yeah, uh, well, I feel it can take up a lot of time and can be distracting. Uh, this is not good for us who find that there's not enough time in a day and so we have to make all our time count if we want to get close to that balanced lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. So let's continue with biofeedback. Um, can you tell the listeners how it's used for headache patients? Biofeedback can help someone become more aware of stress uh, and then employ relaxation strategies to check this stress cycle from festering. 
Together along with CBT, it has been found to be more effective than any one strategy alone. And they've been found to be even more effective when combined with medication in the headache population, both for tension type headaches and actually migraines. This implies that behavioral techniques and medications work on headaches by different mechanisms. Interesting. Um, so we already discussed biofeedback and relaxation strategies in detail in episode 5. Um, but what you're seeing is that a practical technique to check this vicious cycle of fight or flight response is to become aware of your stress level and then use relaxation strategies to check it. And that this process can be facilitated by CBT, healthy living, and biofeedback. Well, it's more than just me saying it. The U.S. Consortium for Headaches gave CBT, relaxation training, and biofeedback grade A evidence. But how many headache patients take effective breaks frequently enough just to bring down mm -hmm. their levels of stress? Just some daily maintenance to keep us from having the stress response from running amok. Something just like taking a few minutes to do some resonance frequency breathing or visual imagery a few times a day can be pretty helpful. Mm, but I suppose not enough to take the time. Again, I know this is something we've mentioned in nearly every episode of this podcast series, but psychological factors are hugely influential in most medical conditions. For example, many headache patients don't have the coping skills to manage stress and chronic headaches. And if you take patients who also have mood disorders, anxiety disorders, uh, personality disorders like borderline personality disorder, they're three times less likely to adhere to treatment recommendations. They're also less likely to tolerate the drugs. Um, and to respond to treatments in general, both pharmacological and behavioral therapy. And they are more likely to get more headaches and worse headaches, which is more likely to make their psychological distress worse. Mm, it makes sense. Can you discuss some of the other lifestyle fa factors we encourage to help headaches? The interesting thing is that for most people, we don't really spend too much time on quote-unquote treating the headache. Most of our attention is on treating the patient. For most people, the headache is a nuisance, but doesn't hold them back from doing the many uh, rehab exercises we offer them, or doesn't hold them back from coming to appointments. And for the most part, the headaches just get better with lifestyle measures used to treat fatigue, balance issues, insomnia, and so on. That being said, one of the most helpful things I feel is for us to help patients manage their own expectations of themselves with respect to what their abilities are uh, and what they should give themselves a break with. We help advocate for them in the form of letters that go to their schools and workplaces. Letters that are sufficiently detailed that they are helpful for the employers, but also removes the stigma of having this quote-unquote unseen injury that some may doubt is completely genuine. Or maybe some just don't understand it the way they would understand a knee problem that causes you to limp. Treating sleep difficulties is something that's very helpful for headache and concussion patients. And we already discussed it in some detail in episode 3, Troubles with Mr. Sandman. Energy management is also something we touch on in episode 4, to rest or not to rest, but uh, we will be going into greater detail in a future episode with Caitlin, our occupational therapist. We also um, touch on diet in that same episode, although admittedly, we didn't go into great detail about that. We really just highlighted some dietary basics and some practical hurdles one may face uh, when implementing dietary changes. These are all very important factors in helping manage headaches and concussions. But I will leave them aside from this episode discussion, as those recordings are available to all our listeners to review at their convenience. So what about the role exercise plays in headache management? Can you talk more about it? Sure. I just wanted to mention one thing about diet in this context of headaches. Reducing or eliminating caffeine is advised. If you can't eliminate it, then aim to keep your caffeine intake consistent. That is, try to have it at the same time every day and the same amount. Aim for less than 200 milligrams a day of caffeine. And um, eating nutritious meals at regular intervals, avoiding skipping meals, and keeping an eye out to stay well hydrated throughout the day is a good starting point. Well, thanks for highlighting that. But to go back to exercise, for most of our patients, again, we don't use exercise as a specific technique to target headaches. We use it more because it provides many health benefits. For example, it improves mood and energy level. Uh, many of our patients are wanting to get back into exercise, but we're told they shouldn't. However, concussion research is showing that patients should be supported in getting back into cardiovascular exercise earlier. Yes, and there are some fascinating benefits to exercise at the neurophysiological level too. 
Yes, well, exercise has been linked with a decrease in cognitive decline. In fact, the motor cortex, the part of the brain felt to be responsible for voluntary musculoskeletal movement, is not only used in ordering, sequencing, and timing physical acts, but also for uh, cognitive acts. Physical and mental activities in this context use the same neural circuits. It also improves measures of heart rate variability, a topic we touched uh, on episode 5. We also have a very good article on the heart rate variability on our website. So the link will be in the uh, episode description of this podcast. But this is also reflective to increase autonomic nervous system resilience. Yes, exercise also has good effects on the cerebrovascular physiology of the brain and has been associated with increases in BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor which has many beneficial effects on the nervous system. I know some patients will ask what BDNF does. Well, it's a good question. Simply put, it helps support the integrity of existing neurons and encourages the development of new neurons and synapses, which usually translates to improved cognitive abilities. Yeah, And exercise also helps with retraining balance and reducing the type of dizziness often seen in concussion patients. Yes, when done strategically, it's very helpful. Exercise is also helpful for strengthening patients' cores, and improving their neck issues once they have learned the ideal movement patterns. So how do you know where to start the cardiovascular exercise program in concussion patients? Well, this depends on many variables, and I know we'll be going into this in more detail in a future episode, but we find a lot of benefit by using the Buffalo Treadmill Protocol. This is a test that the patient performs on a treadmill that follows a specific protocol. The main thing is that the exertion level is gradually increased, and the heart rate response, among other things, is measured. By observing the data, you can find the ideal threshold heart rate that the patient should stay under when doing their home exercise plan. Okay, and what's the reasoning behind getting patients not to push themselves past this determined heart rate? It has been shown that exercising at this level correlates with faster improvement in cardiovascular ability and also decreasing symptoms. It helps restore balance to a dysfunctional autonomic nervous system. Now, I know getting patients to stick to an exercise program can be tough, especially patients who don't feel that great. So what kind of things do you feel are helpful in encouraging adherence to the home exercise plan? First, I think education is the cornerstone. We have one patient recently who told me flat out that she hates exercise and doesn't really want to do it. After we educated her about the benefits of exercise and the context of her symptoms, the ball was in her court, so to speak. She then came around and realized that the exercise was like medicine, a bitter medicine in her case, that would make her feel better and that would have positive side effects. So how do you keep patients motivated? We get them to keep exercise journals and we set goals. And once they achieve them, we set new ones. We check in with them regarding their home exercise program, usually two times per week. And sometimes patients confess that it helps them feel motivated. This way they feel that they're part of the team. We tell them to also document the relaxation exercises so they make a point of scheduling them. Now, I know you use telemedicine often to do this. Yes, many of our patients come from pretty far away. And while it has its limitations when it comes to physical exams or being able to prompt patients to perform the ideal movement, it can still be helpful. I've had them position their cameras to show me the way they're doing their exercises. And if I feel they're not doing it right, I'll show the camera on myself and I'll demonstrate how they should be doing them. And on many occasions, I've managed to get them to correct it right over the video. Um, Often for them, it's a refresher because I've already shown them in the clinic. So it's easier for them to kind of relearn it in that context. Right. So let me bring it back to headaches again. So you were telling the listeners that you usually don't really need to focus on the headaches in concussion patients as they can usually use the strategies we just discussed to get on pretty well. Right. And treating some other things that we will be discussing in future episodes like cognitive strategies, energy management, managing visual issues, and so on. From the discussion we just had on exercise, we can see that the focus was more on performance and improving behaviors and mindsets. But what about for those patients with more severe headaches? You know, those patients for whom even coming to appointments uh, is challenging or simple exercise can see them with a migraine that lasts one or two days. This is more challenging for many of the reasons we mentioned in part one of this episode. 
uh, for these patients, medical management and preventative management becomes more important. Now, I know this episode wasn't meant to go into medication, although it's a very mm -hmm. important part of headache management, especially for these types of patients. Um, there are generally two classes of headache medications, acute or abortive medications and preventive medications. The idea being that preventive medications are those you take daily to help reduce the frequency and severity of headaches and abortive medications that you take when you do end up getting a headache to help decrease the pain it's causing you. However, this is something our listeners' doctors will handle, and so the emphasis in this episode was meant to educate patients more on the sort of things that are within the scope. So leaving medication aside for now, what's the general approach for this type of patient? First, I would say getting an accurate diagnosis of the type of headache or headaches the patient has. Some have more than one type of headache. Um, while many of the treatments we discussed work for many types of headaches, uh, there is evidence for certain treatments for certain types of headaches. For example, certain vitamins, minerals, and herbs have been found to be useful in migraines, but not that useful in the treatment of tension-type headaches. And then, to accurately diagnose all the comorbid conditions the patient has, those from before the concussion and from those after the concussion, Accurately diagnosing the neck, balance, visual, uh, cognitive, sleep, and psychological issues, and so on, will lend context to the diagnosis of headache. And often addressing these are more powerful treatment options for those with post-traumatic headaches than traditional headache treatments, quote-unquote, are. Also, certain diagnoses may require more tests. Yes, while fortunately these are not common post-concussion, one always has to look out for those red flags that something more serious might be going on. But once you're sure that you're not dealing with that sort of headache, then education becomes very important. Hence the reason for this podcast. I feel this episode and the previous one will provide patients with a lot of information about migraine and the sort of attitudes and behaviors that can help them out. Yes, in fact, there was a study called the Women's Health and Migraine Trial that looked at the effect of training weight loss behaviors in patients versus educating patients about migraines. Both groups had decreased migraine severity and frequency. That's interesting that just education is linked to less migraines. Perhaps the mechanism for why this is relates to the discussion we had in the previous episode regarding the experience of pain. Perhaps understanding the process helps the frontal lobes to inhibit other parts of the brain involved in migraine. And it is interesting that developing weight loss behavior resulted in less migraine symptoms too. We have mentioned already a few lifestyle measures that are linked to improving migraines, improving sleep, diet, exercise. Are there some other common lifestyle measures that can help reduce triggering migraines and migraine sufferers? The classic triggers most patients think of are weather changes, causing changes in barometric pressure or temperature, uh, certain food triggers like sulfites, nitrites, and MSG and alcohol. Uh, most have heard of patients that have migraines triggered by scents or too much noise. But the most common triggers we see other than stress would be neck issues and visual issues. Yes, many of our patients do wear tinted lenses to decrease their sensitivity to light. Yes, and many complain that reading or doing sustained near work aggravates their migraines and also their dizziness. We will be discussing both those topics in future episodes, but migraines can make one more sensitive to light and light in light-sensitive patients can make their migraines worse. And so some strategies to get around this for our patients is to work on their visual inefficiency, as well as working on the way they process sensory information to control perception and movement. This is an exciting area, and yes, will be the topic of other episodes. Neck issues are also something that can be caused by headaches or uh, also cause headaches. Um, we talked about neck issues already in episodes 7 and 8, what the heck neck. But can you speak a little bit uh, about the neck in the context of headaches post-concussion? Yes. So neck issues are common in concussion patients for reasons we mentioned in episode 7. Many of the structures in the neck can refer pain along muscles and nerves that travel all over the head. For example, even neck structures at the back of your neck can cause pain to be referred around the top of your head or even around the eyes, which surprises a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. uh, but also migraines, a process that occurs within the skull, can be triggered by neck issues, something that occurs outside the skull. For example, the occipital nerves at the upper part of the back of the neck send signals back to the nerve roots, which can then modulate nerve signals traveling down from the brainstem regions 
that I have a hand in generating migraines. And this is one of the reasons why nerve blocks using the same kind of freezing that you get at the dentist's office to freeze those nerves can decrease migraines. That's interesting because it eluded us for a while as to how a freezing that only lasts a few hours injected outside the skull can cause a difference in migraines on the other side of the skull. Even on a botulinum A or Botox is now used with quite a bit of success for those with chronic migraines and the mechanism follows a similar principle. It doesn't work by temporarily paralyzing the muscles like for cosmetic Botox injections, but the injection sites are at nerve sites, so it works by reducing transmission of those nerve signals back to the brain. These injections are nice options too for concussion patients because they reduce the risk of the side effects uh, that they may face if they use the medications that are commonly used for migraine prevention. Side effects like cognitive slowing, sleep changes, fatigue, issues with visual accommodation, and other functions of the autonomic nervous system like feeling lightheaded or having a dry mouth. That's a good point. A lot of concussion patients already have these symptoms, and so taking drugs that can make those symptoms worse is something to consider before prescribing. Although there's a new class of drugs, the anti-CGRP, which looks promising as they are biological, so they're not metabolized by the body, and have a very low incidence of side effects and have good success rates. Yes, it's exciting as this is the first preventative drug that has been designed specifically for migraines, specifically targeting the biochemistry of how migraines are generated. Migraine research made a great advance with NTCGRP. Now, can you discuss with us how healthcare professionals and patients track headaches together? Most places use headache journals. There are many headache tracking apps and resources online, and some are simpler than others. Most find that the simpler apps are uh, easier to use and good enough to get the job done. And when I say job done, I don't mean to say that tracking the headaches will improve outcomes. Actually, there was a study that looked at that and found that that's not the case, even after two years of diligent tracking. But patients in the midst of their busy lives and the symptoms of headaches sometimes won't remember the severity or the timing of their headaches if they don't enter it into the log in real time. So it's best to keep it simple. Also, really, what we want the headache diary to do is to help us optimize behaviors for headache management. Okay, so can you describe that link between the headache journal and behaviors? Uh, for example, one journal system used to differentiate the severity of headaches is a traffic light system. So the day is divided up into segments. In our clinic, we divide it up into six-hour blocks, so four segments per day. And the patient leaves the block blank if she has no headache. If she has a headache, then it can be a green light headache, which means I can still go. I can still go on with my daily activities. Or a yellow light headache meaning, oh, I got to slow down rather than I have to stop. Or a red light headache, which means I have to stop. This reflects the principles outlined in CBT, where the focus should be on behaviors and, and not on emotional reactions to perceptions of pain. For example, if someone has a green or yellow light headache and constantly drops everything and nurses themselves at home, it may lead to social and health consequences that may make the illness worse, although obviously the patient was well-intentioned. Right. So patients can titrate their behaviors and activities more objectively by assigning green, yellow, and red lights to their headaches. A pretty intuitive scheme. And then on a more practical level, grading the headache severity helps pick the most efficient treatment. Can you elaborate what you mean by that? Well, to start, it's best to treat migraines as early as they come. Migraines can become severe within 20 to 60 minutes. And if treating after 60 minutes from onset, treatment success drops from 80% to 50%. I see many patients try to hold off from using their medications to try to ration how much medication they use in a month. Some have been warned of the medication overuse headache thing that we discussed before, and so they're fearful of that. And again, the controversy is that maybe we are doing some patients more harm by worrying them about it. For example, I saw a lady a few days ago who suffers from daily severe migraines, and she says she was told that she should limit her triptan use to just five times per month to avoid that medication overuse headache. However, medication overuse headache is not thought to be an issue if triptans are taken less than 10 times per month. Secondly, if she were to take triptans on more than 10 days per month, it would be hard to tell if she was suffering from a medication overuse headache or just a severe migraine that was hard to control with just acute medications. 
the journal would reflect worsening patterns of headache after treatment was started, I suppose, if it were medication overuse headache. Or perhaps the worsening patterns can be seen when medications are not used enough. Or maybe something changed in the patient's lifestyle at that time that made the headache worse. Or maybe it's just the natural history of the illness, meaning we don't know why. Mm. Uh, but the main point is that if you are treating a severe headache with a, a mild medication, it might not be as effective. Or some patients and physicians pre prefer to be cautious when starting triptans for migraines. However, for most people, triptans are well-tolerated medications. Um, and it's usually best to start at high doses uh, rather than starting at low doses and slowly work your way up. It sounds like you're saying that in this case, the best defense is a good offense. Because of the pathophysiology that we discussed earlier, it's better to treat it effectively right off the bat. A lot of patients prefer nutraceuticals or herbs, supplements, and vitamins to treat their migraines over prescription medications. Can you talk a bit about this? Well, yeah. Our patients are using them, and even a lot of specialists recommend them. There are many different drugs that have been looked at, but the ones for which there's the most evidence uh, is magnesium, riboflavin, or vitamin B2, and an extract called MIG-99 from a plant called Feverfew. Now, they do have their risk also, so not everyone should take them, right? Well, magnesium shouldn't be taken by those with kidney failure. There is some debate over whether it's safe in pregnancy, although the studies that found that it was not advisable in pregnancy looked at women who took it IV. Uh, some patients complain of loose bowel motions with this, and the magnesium glycanate formula might help mitigate this. Patients who take magnesium with high doses of zinc may interfere with magnesium's absorption. It's good also to tell patients not to worry about the neon-looking urine they get if they take vitamin B2. That seems to be the only side effect people complain of. Vitamin B2 seems to be safe in pregnancy and doesn't seem to interact with any drugs. Now, what is Feverfew? It's an herb with anti-inflammatory properties. It seems to be well tolerated. Only few people complain of nausea, digestive issues, and bloating with it. Chewing it can irritate the mouth's lining, but it's really the MIG-99 extract that has been found helpful for migraines. Those who take it regularly may experience symptoms of insomnia, headache, muscle stiffness, and anxiety if they stop abruptly. Um, this herb is not recommended during pregnancy as it may cause uterine contractions. What about coenzyme Q10 and Butterbur? Coenzyme Q10 has less evidence for its effectiveness in migraine prevention, but it's felt that it is probably helpful and could be considered. Uh, Butterbur actually had the strongest evidence for its use, but there was some concerns about its safety. Basically, the plant has some com compounds that are toxic to the liver. Uh, these toxins are supposed to be removed before distribution to the public. However, many formulations were found to have unacceptable levels of these compounds, and so most headache groups have stopped recommending it. Can you get it without the toxins? The issue is that herbs and supplements like these are not subject to the same rigorous standards by the FDA as our pharmaceutical drugs. So the recommendation that is often made is that if you're going to use butter fur, make sure it's labeled as PA or pyrolizidine alkaloid free and try to purchase products that have the label of third party laboratories that have examined the product and certify that it is in fact PA free. Seals like National Science Foundations, Consumer Lab Testing, or U.S. Pharmacopeia. So how effective are nutraceuticals? Well, to give you an example, one of the first trials looked at 600 milligrams of magnesium daily in one group of migraineurs versus another group of migraineurs who just received placebo. And around the ninth week, the magnesium group had about a 42% reduction in the frequency of the headache versus the 16% in the placebo group. There was no significant difference in the two groups with respect to headache severity. Interesting. So I wanted to shift gears and talk to you about complementary and integrative medicine. We know that most of our patients are using it. A study of European headache centers found that over 80% of patients employ some form of it. Um, the most commonly used modalities worldwide are reported to be acupuncture, massage, um, chiropractic care, and homeopathy. Let's start off with acupuncture. What's this thinking on that in the headache management? Whenever studies are done, there's always an effort to just compare apples to apples. That is, make sure that you're only comparing two things and all other factors between the two groups you are comparing are the same. 
So for acupuncture, it's hard to do that because the nature of acupuncture. Well, I can see a couple of challenges right off the bat. Um, and acupuncture can be done in many different ways. Um, and in studies, when participants get sham acupuncture, so acupuncture needles randomly inserted at places that don't make sense in the context of acupuncture theory, um, it's hard to know what the effect of that is. Right. Or one group doesn't get anything at all. But then you could argue that you're not comparing apples to apples because the act of breaking the skin may create a placebo effect. This seems to be the challenge with all studies involving integrative health. So many doctors are not big on endorsing integrative medicine because the study findings may not be so robust, but this stares in the face of the fact that many patients use them and obviously find them helpful. So what are the findings for acupuncture? Well, the bottom line is that studies have shown it to be helpful for headache pain and prevention. Some will argue that there is not a big difference between sham acupuncture and proper acupuncture. But many healthcare providers don't see this as a big deal, as both groups showed improvement in headaches compared to those who didn't receive any acupuncture at all. Okay, so massage is another popular treatment. What are the findings for that? There are studies showing benefit and others showing not so much. Um, a systematic review in 2011 showed that massage therapy reduced migraine frequency by about 28%. Many patients find it helps. It's hard to know if there's a specific mechanism unique to massage that's actually helping or if it's just helping people reduce stress and that stress reduction is helping them with their headaches. Right. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about how stress management helps. Um, and we spend time also talking about uh, how integrative approaches may target headaches through a different mechanism than medication. What about yoga and tai chi? Same deal. There are challenges to studying it as it's practiced in many different ways in many different studies. Some showed benefit and others haven't. For example, uh, a study out of India showed one hour a day of yoga for 12 weeks helped migraines. Uh, it helps stress, pain, and a sense of well-being also. But then you wonder how many patients can actually do yoga for an hour a day. But you also wonder if less than an hour per day of yoga can still be helpful, as so many people find it helpful. I think it's one of those things. Uh, people will do it if they're interested. And if they are interested, they will likely enjoy it. We know exercise is good for headaches and also good for concussions. So is stress management. So if someone is doing yoga because she enjoys the exercise and the relaxation, I feel it will be more helpful. Where if someone is doing yoga with the same spirit as one would take a pill, I'm not sure how effective it would be. Headache and concussion patients is such a big topic, and I feel we could spend several more episodes talking about this. There are many things we didn't have a chance to discuss, which many patients are using. Things like neuromodulation, medical cannabis, injections, um, the effects of hormones on headaches, other integrative approaches like cranial cycle therapy, uh, matrix repatterning, and the list goes on and on. And then we mentioned it already, but treating all the other things people face in concussion, the topics we are covering in this podcast series, will usually help with these patients' headaches. Yes, but we'll be going into vestibular, visual, cognitive, and fatigue consequences of concussion in future episodes. Um, treating issues in these areas has helped our patients with their headaches. I'd like to thank our listeners for tuning in, and I hope these two episodes on headaches gave you all some background into the culture of headache management in the context of concussions. And as we mentioned, even education about headaches has been found to help improve headaches. Thank you for all that education today, Tahir. We will continue in our next episode with our discussion on dizziness and imbalance post-concussion. Thank you for listening to the Concussion 101 podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a review. For more information about concussion-related topics, visit us at www.yorkconcussion.ca. Stay tuned for our next episode.